everyone. Today we have the pleasure of uh, receiving here at the IIP Professor Luis Davidovich from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, this is, uh, just to remember, this is a joint colloquium between the IIP and the uh, Physics Department of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. And as a matter of fact, is the opening co uh, colloquium of the second uh, semester. So before passing uh, the word to Luis, I would, well, I tried hard to make a short, brief uh, summary of his achievements, but as you can see, it's not that short, so... Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, so Professor Luis Davidovich obtained his uh, PhD in 1976 at the University of Rochester in New York under the supervision of Professor Moises Nussenzweig in the area of uh, quantum optics. After he, his uh, PhD, he stayed for about one year at the ETH in Zurich as an assistant professor before returning to Brazil as a professor of PUC, the Pontificia Universidade Católica of Rio de Janeiro. Starting in uh, 1986, he has been a visiting researcher in various uh, renowned uh, institutions, institutions around the world, just to cite a few. They're called Normal Super Superiore, I'm sorry, my French is not the best. <laughs> uh, in Paris, the Max Planck Institute in Garchen and Dresden, the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge, and many others. In particular, he was involved in many of the original proposals to use a, a QED in uh, cavities to study quant the quantum to the classical transition, and that uh, led somehow to the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in 2012 to his lifelong friend and collaborator, uh, Sej Harosh. In 1994, he has moved to the uh, Federal U University of uh, Rio de Janeiro as a full professor, a, pl a place where he started a very prominent research gr uh, group responsible for the formation of many generations of Brazilian and international researchers, including dozens of master and PhD supervisions and more than a hundred of uh, very visible scientific uh, publications. His interests are very broad, the most recent ones, including uh, apart from quantum optics, entanglement theory, quantum computation, decoherence, and quantum metrology. As a matter of fact, uh, Professor Luis Davidovich was one of the pioneers of the field of quantum information and quantum computation in Brazil, being the coordinator of the INCT, the National Institute of Science and Technology of Quantum Information between uh, 2001 and 2006. Not surprisingly, Professor uh, Luis Davidovich has received many important scientific uh, awards, so just to cite some here. 2000, he received the uh, Great Cross, the Gran Cruz of Ordem Nacional do Mérito Científico, given by the Brazilian president in the year 2000. 2001, he received the Physics Prize from the Academy of Sciences for the Development World. And in 2010, he received the Tamandaré Medal from the Brazilian Navy and the Almirante Álvaro Al Alberto Prize from CNPq, the later being perhaps the highest honor within the uh, Brazilian science. So finally, and also very important, Luis has made and continues to do so very important contributions to the science funding and support in Brazil. He's a permanent member of the World, of the World Ac Academy of Sciences, an associate member of the National Academy of Sciences, and since last year, He's the president of uh, ABC, the Brazilian Academy of uh, Science. Fine. So please, let's give a warm uh, round of applause. Well, it is a big pleasure to be here. I should say that uh, uh, Rafael omitted perhaps one of the most important uh, achievements in my career which was to be of being the uh, PhD advisor of Rafael and of Leandro, who is there. Huh? So very important achievement. Huh? Uh, and it's very nice to be introduced here by, by, by Rafael and see Leandro there participating in, the, in this workshop on, on quantum information. So my, my colloquium here uh, will be addressed to non-specialists. So since it's a joint colloquium, that, that makes it a kind of colloquium because uh, I think the colleagues from the quantum information workshop will listen to many things that they already know. Uh, uh, others perhaps uh, are, as Asher Perez used to say, uh, known by the people who know it, uh, and <laughs> which is a subclass of all the people, 
But anyway, I, I will practically, you know, I, I will not have equations really. Very few equations. My emphasis will be on, the, on some conceptual aspects of quantum information. So, you know, if I'm going to talk about quantum information, the first question is actually an awkward question, maybe. It's what is information? <laughs> I'm talking about information, so what is information? How do you define information? And, you know, when I have more time, I stop at this point and I ask the people in the audience huh, how, what they think, but I don't have time for that, huh, so I'm going to give you the answer. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the etymology of the word, that gives us a clue. Uh, information means form inside, which means, you know, organize. Uh, form inside, organize. In fact, this can be measured, and Claude Shannon, in 1948, uh, invented a, a measure for it. In fact, he defined information as anything that reduces uncertainty. Or, if you want, it's the difference in organization or uncertainty before and after getting a message. In this sense, the DNA has information, of course, uh, because it helps to organize. Now, the Shannon entropy for a set of, uh, which is defined in this way, so a set of events or numbers, that x has the value uh, x, small x, uh, the corresponding entropy is given by this expression here, and you see from this expression that if p of x is 1 for one of the events and 0 for the others, you get from this expression uh, here, you get the, that the entropy is equal to 0, right? Because log of 1 is equal to, to 0. So uh, only one term contributes and the total value is 0. So that means that the entropy uh, here is a measure of the uncertainty in the sense that if p of x is equal to 1, for only one of the members of the set, you know what is the value of capital X. On the other hand, if P of X has the same value for all members of the set, then H has the maximum value, uh, uh, which corresponds to equal values for all the probabilities. Okay? So it's a measure of uncertainty, like it is said there. Now, what about classical information? Well, you know, I think everybody here knows about some... Uh, some uh, properties of classical information. Uh, information can be discretized. The elementary unit of information is the bit. We now call it, we now call it also C bit, C bit, or classical bit, which has only two states, 0 and 1, which could be true uh, or false, uh, yes or not, and so forth. Any text can be codified by a sequence of bits. Bits can be physically stored in this state, say, on or off of a transistor in a, magne in a magnetic domain. They are, are robust, the two states are robust. They are not destroyed when read and can be easily copied or cloned. Uh, you use a pen drive, you copy the information from your hard drive, and when you, when you read something in your hard drive, you don't destroy the information. Many of these properties will be changed when you go to quantum information. And in fact, uh, the big reason for this change of view on information was the quantum revolution. It started, as you know, in, 19, in, in 1900 with the work of Max Planck, followed by the work of Einstein in 1905. And that work led to the conception that light behaves in some experiments as if it were a stream of particles, later on called photons. Now, this uh, evolution, this development of, of quantum physics, led people to think about the very concept of information and its relation to physics. And a very nice example comes from John Wheeler, uh, who uh, wrote down this topic, stating that it is not unreasonable to imagine that information sits at the core of physics, just as it sits at the core of a computer. So, if you are getting, uh, if you are detecting gravitational waves coming from a black hole, you are actually getting some information which you can digitalize as a sequence of zeros and ones, and you then try to build or to confirm a theory from these observations. You get information through this measurement. Or if you detect some new particle again, uh, 
you are getting information about the nature. Furthermore, he said, every physical quantity, every it, derives its ultimate significance from bits, binary yes or no indications, a conclusion which we epitomize in the phrase it from bit. Bit is information, it is the object in nature. And you get information on it from bits. Okay? Now, uh, Rolf Landauer, who was a chief scientist of IBM, would say it in a more emphatic way. He would say information is physical. Information is not a disembodied abstract entity. It is always tied to a physical representation. It is represented by engraving on a stone tablet, a spin, a charge, a hole in a punched card, a mark on paper, or some other equivalent. You see, he was from the time where uh, compute, computing was done with holes on punched cards. I was not born at that time. Huh? Why did you laugh? Anyway. So, now that initial quantum uh, revolution was followed by a second one, much more recent, the development of a new quantum technology at the end of the 20th century. One example of that is uh, this ion trap, where you see seven ions oscillating here. This is not a simulation. This was a movie done by Heiner Blatt, who is in Innsbruck. Huh? And the movie was obtained by shining a laser light on the ions, so the laser light is reflected towards your eyes, so you see them. Huh? These ions are a trap, a harmonic trap. So here you have a center of mass motion in the harmonic trap. You can also have this other kind of mode of oscillation, so you can actually manipulate these ions by using lasers, and you can do that individually for each, for each ion. Another example comes from the field called cavity quantum electrodynamics, in which you can trap a single photon in a cavity, which is made of two uh, highly reflecting mirrors. In fact, that's superconducting niobium to uh, reduce the losses. And you can trap a photon here for a time which is of the order of a fraction of a second, uh, one-tenth of a second. For the students, just make this calculation. Well, it's easy. Huh? A photon that is trapped for one-tenth of a second travels how much inside the cavity? Just between the two mirrors. Speed of light, huh? 300,000 kilometers per second. So the, that photon trapped inside those two mirrors travels 30,000 kilometers, which is almost the circumference of the Earth. Okay? So you trap that photon there, and then you send a single atom, and you control the interaction of a single atom with a single photon trapped between the two mirrors. Uh, five centimeters. Okay? Now, another example more recent, that is from 2016, uh, is, uh, is one of the many experiments that have been done trying to produce a single photon device, a device that emits a single photon uh, in uh, an almost uh, a sure way. That's not, not, not probabilistically, but, but in a sure way. And of course, many optical chips have sh appeared, which allow to do uh, very precise experiments involving uh, interesting states of, of, of the light, like, for instance, entangled photons. And I'm going to tell you about entanglement in a while. So, since we now have single photons, single atoms, and we can manipulate them, then we could as well have fun thinking about single photons as flying qubits. So first, you know, just you should realize that the polarization of single photon can be considered as a classical bit. So if the photon is polarized horizontally, that's, that corresponds, say, to the value zero of a bit. If it is polarized vertic vertically, that corresponds to the value one of a bit, and we can represent these two states using the so-called Dirac representation in this way. So this is state H of the polarization of the photon, that's the state V. But of course, uh, uh, well, of course this polarization can be measured by polarizers like this one, or even this polarized cube, that's a polarized beam splitter, which is like light, you know? Uh, photons polarized horizontally go through, Photons polarized vertical, vertically are reflected, okay? So two ways of measuring the polarization of a photon. Now, of course, a photon, the polarization of the photon can have any direction, 
uh, uh, you know, just making this uh, arrow uh, rotate gave me much more work than writing down all these slides. Uh, yeah, I'm very proud of that. Uh. Anyway, so you can have an arbitrary direction. Now, uh, if, if a photon polarization has some arbitrary direction, you write its state as a linear combination of the state corresponding to horizontal polarization and the state corresponding to vertical polarization, where according to quantum mechanics, A and B are complex in general. So uh, uh, this polarization is in a superposition of the horizontal polarization and the vertical polarization. Now, if you send a single photon to a polarizer, then this photon will have some probability of going through, which depends on the angle between the polarization of the photon and the axis of the polarizer. Right? Uh, furthermore, uh, after the photon goes through the polarizer, its polarization is given by the axis of the polarizer. So in general, uh, when a photon crosses a polarizer, its polarization changes. Also, if the polarization of the photon is orthogonal to the axis of the polarizer, then if the polarizer is perfect, the photon will not go through, so the probability of going through is zero, and it's maximal when they are aligned. Now, of course, if the probability that the photon goes through is small, that corresponds to a strong, to a low intensity of the light composed of many photons, because each photon has a small probability. So with that, you connect the microscopic description with the macroscopic one in t for a light with many photons, a classical light. So, now this simple discussion leads us to some interesting concepts about quantum information. I told you that you could consider a single photon as a qubit, as a quantum bit, a superposition of H and V. Now, you see that if you do not know a priori the direction of the polarization of a photon, the measurement along any other direction changes the photon polarization. That's, after all, the role of a polarizer. Okay? So that's different from what we had in classical information, in the sense that there you measure a bit, you don't destroy the bit. You can do that. Huh? You can measure a bit without changing its value. Here, you know, in general, you change the, the value of the qubit. Also, it's not possible to measure the polarization of a single photon. Because when you put a polarizer in front of it, the photon goes through. I know that it's polarized along the axis of the, the, the polarizer, but I don't know anything about the polarization before the polarizer, because it was changed by the polarizer. So, of course, if I have zillions of photons, I can measure the polarization, because I then rot rotate the polarizer until the transmission is maximal. And then, haha, I know what's the direction. Okay? But for a single photon, I cannot measure the polarization. Third point, it is not possible to clone a qubit. And that was shown by Uters and Zurek, and also Dix independently in 1982. What does that mean? That means that you know, pen drives are not allowed in quantum mechanics. Huh? You cannot copy an information in general. Of a, you cannot copy the information of a qubit or the state of a qubit from one, from one particle to the other. You cannot copy it. Of course, you can produce many qubits in the same way if you have a machine. But if you get a qubit from someone and you don't have that machine, you cannot copy that state. Now, I'm going to discuss it later because I think that this no cloning theorem has some intriguing implications on the foundations of quantum mechanics. For me, it's a very interesting result. You see, I'm not going to demonstrate the, the no cloning theorem here, because if I do that, I will violate my first assessment that I will not have equations in this talk. Huh? But it's a simple derivation, and in fact, it's based only on the structure of the Hilbert space and on the fact that transformations on space are linear transformations, huh? unitary evolutions, or even non-unitary evolutions, but linear. Okay, these two facts imply that you cannot clone a qubit. Huh? Now, uh, first, uh, first implication of these results, if we could clone a qubit, we could make zillions of copies of qubits identical to the original one, which means that I would be able to measure the state of a single qubit. Uh, because then you have many photons, I put a polarizer, I know what the polarization is. Uh, so the no cloning is intimately associated to the fact 
that you cannot measure the state of a single qubit. And therefore, you cannot associate in this sense a state with a single qubit. You cannot measure it. Okay? Very important result. Okay? We'll have another consequence later on. I'm going to comment on that. That's, strangely enough, related to causality. Right? And, and what's strange about it is that the derivation of the, of the non-cloning theorem, as I mentioned, makes use only of the structure of a Hilbert space and the linearity of the transformation. It does not tell anything about the dynamics. It does not require anything about the dynamics. So it may be non-relativistic, it may be relativistic, but causality is preserved by the no-cloning theorem. Intriguing fact. We are going back to it later on. Now, so, you know, this list of properties are quite different from what we saw before when we want to retrieve classical information. And it looks like a desperate state of affairs, because after all, you know, you cannot uh, measure the, the polarization of a single photon. Uh, if you try to measure, you change it, and you cannot copy it. So, you know, what is this good for? <laughs> and I'm going to show you that this has an interesting application. And the interesting application is in cryptography, having to do with key distribution. Now, what is that? Well, suppose we have this summation rule for bits, uh, usual, usually a base 2 uh, summation rule. 1 plus 1 is equal to 0, 1 plus 0 is equal to 1. This is 1, this is 0, OK? Now, suppose you want to send a message to your friend, and this message you codify in terms of bits, like, for instance, this one. Now, you don't want a spy to get this message, so you produce a random key, which is a random succession of zeros and ones. And you add this random key to the original message. Now, if you use this sum rule, you get then the code and message given by this expression. Now, since this is a random key and this is added to the original message, the code and message is also a random succession of ones and zeros. So if the spy gets it, he cannot do anything about it. Now, your friend, however, if he has the same key that you have, he may then, when he gets this coded message, add the key to this message, and if you apply this rule, you get the original message. Okay? So that's a, that's a strategy which is a very old, which is very old in cryptography, and uh, which requires, however, a key which has the same size as the message you want to use. And this has some problem, because you, know, you can imagine that even if you have a, a key long enough, after some time, your stock of key is over, of keys is over, so you must share a different key between you and your friend. And sharing the key is the big danger. In fact, it is where the you know, spy movies come in, uh, spies trying to get the key to decode the messages. Uh. Now, quantum mechanics help us. And in fact, the properties I mentioned before can help us to uh, increase the security of messages. What is the idea? The idea was discussed by Bennett and Brassard in 1984. It is the so-called four-state protocol. It is, in my view, the simplest protocol. There are other more sophisticated protocols. I'm going to stick with this one. So I've ha I have here two friends. And Alice wants to send a message to Bob. Huh? Uh, of course, she wants to uh, codify this message. So the first step is to share random code with Bob. And she wants to do it in such a way that if a spy tries to get the, the, the code, huh? the random code, at least they will know that somebody was there listening. Okay? So they have to look for another channel for sharing this. this, this this code. So what's the idea? Why is it four state protocol? Well, indeed, Alice has these four polarizers here uh, with different axis directions. So he has one polarizer, which is a uh, couple of polarizers, if you want, that corresponds to the horizontal vertical axis. And she also has another couple of polarizers corresponding to the diagonal directions here. She arranges with Bob a convention that, you know, if, he, if she uses this couple of polarizers, zero corresponds to this polarization here and one to this one. 
On the other hand, if she uses this other couple of polarizers, this is zero and this is one. And Bob agrees with that. Now, she then starts sending photons to Bob using randomly one of these four plates. Okay? Just randomly. Huh? Throw in the coin if, if you want. Bob, on the other hand, has these two plates here, which correspond to the first couple or the second couple of plates. And, and uh, he agrees with Alice about this coding here. That they agree. But of course, when he measures the photo sent by Alice, he doesn't know which plates Alice has used. Okay? Now, suppose Alice takes this first photo here. That's the first one which was sent by Alice and the first one which is going to be received by Bob. Alice used for this photon this plate here. So it should correspond to the number zero, right? Value zero of the bit. Now, Bob uses to uh, measure this photon by chance. The, same, the plate which has the same orientations than this couple here used by Alice. So if Alice sent this photo along this direction, Bob will measure this photo along this direction because he has a polarizer along the same directions. And he finds indeed uh, zero, I mean, the same polarization uh, as Alice sent. Now, for the second uh, uh, photon, uh, Alice uses this set of plates, so this is one, and one is repeated here, and so forth. So, Let's see now the measurements of Bob. I have already advanced this one. So he uses here the same set of plates as Alice used for the first photon. So he's going to measure the same value. Alice sent zero, and Bob measures zero. OK, huh? coincide. Now, Alice sends the second photon using this set of plates. Bob uses, by chance, they're lucky up to now, huh? the same set of plates, or the, the same orientations. So if Alice sends the photo along this direction, Bob, of course, finds that the direction is this one. And so on. But then there are some problems here. For instance, uh, Alice sends now this photo along this direction here, so it is zero. Bob uses this set of plates, but you know, a photo with polarization like this has some probability of being found along this direction here because it has a the polarization has a projection along this direction. So, photo, so Bob detects the photo along this direction and therefore assigns to this photo the value 1, while Alice sent a 0. Aha, uh -huh, disagreement now. Okay? And so on and so on. So after, they collect, after Bob collects all the photons, they go to a public channel, right? which could be this uh, Silvio Santos TV program on TV. Huh? Uh, I don't know if you have seen it. I have never seen it. I don't advise you to watch it. Huh? It, has a, it seems that it has a deleterious effect on the neurons. But anyway, suppose they go there, one of them goes there, and the other goes to a similar program in Japan, huh, if they have one. Huh? And they publicly announce the plates they have used for sending and detecting the photons. Okay? So uh, you see that for the first photon, Alice used these orange-red plates. Bob also used the, uh, this, this plate here, which uh, orange red, and therefore they should coincide on the value of the bit, huh? because they are using the same directions. Huh? So here they keep this value because they know that the value is the same, even though they don't know uh, uh, in principle huh? what should be the value. But of course, now that Bob detected, he can identify according to their convention, it's zero. Okay? Now, uh, here again, huh? Alice sent a blue photon. Bob used a blue detector. Again, this coincides. Third photon, Alice sent, used again this set of plates. Bob used the blue detector. He got the same value as the one of Alice, but by chance, because the projection you know, had 50% chance, the projection was OK. But they disregarded this detection because you know, they cannot rely on it, because different plates are used. So you see the strategy. Strategy. They compare the plates they have used publicly, but they don't tell publicly what are the values. Okay? So they keep then these values, and by keeping these values, they build a random key, which is this one, which they can use now to codify messages. 
Now, suppose there is some spy along the way, and please don't feel that Eve is some uh, machism or, or something like that. It's, that comes from eavesdropping, huh? which is you know, listening in English. Huh? So Eve is along the way, and Eve tries to detect the photons emitted by Alice huh? with these plates. But you see, Alice doesn't know yet when the photons are sent, what are, directions, what are the directions chosen by Alice. So when she tries to detect the photons, she will make errors. Uh, the photos will not come out in 50% of the time in, in the same direction they, they, were, they were sent. So after this, uh, Alice and Bob take a subset of these numbers, and they compare the subset publicly, say half of them. And they see if they coincide. If there are errors, then they can say, OK, someone was on the way. Someone listened to them. Huh? Uh, we, you can show that if they compare, say, half of the number of, 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 of digits, and the number of digits is very large, the probability of having someone listening and not making some error in this half part goes, decreases exponentially with the number of bits. Very good. There can be errors because of noise, of course, and this has been calculated. Okay, so people who work on that calculate what are the, the, the errors that can be tolerated so that this is considered to be uh, sufficiently safe. Of course, there are all met other methods. Rafael was telling about them in the morning, huh? using entanglement and Bell's inequalities, which are more robust in this sense. But again, there are calculations on that. Okay, so that's an application of the no quantum information, huh? not possible to copy. Huh? If you measure, you change it, and you see that you know was very important here. It's precisely you know that protects the information, because when Eve measures, in general, she's going to change the direction. Uh, she cannot copy the photon, so it really protects the information. Okay? So if you want to read more about that, there is this review paper here by Giza in Reviews of Modern Physics in 2002. Now, quantum cryptography has already and, and I'm going to tell you about some spectacular new result in a while. But, you know, this was from 2007. Uh, this was applied uh, to protect the dedicated line used for counting the ballots in an election in Geneva. Okay? So uh, they used uh, quantum cryptography uh, to protect the data against some uh, interventions or some changes of data or interventions on the data. Now, then came another revolution. Uh -huh. In 1935, uh, a very subtle feature of quantum mechanics was a headline in the New York Times. That's the glory for quantum physics. Huh? First page. Huh? And, the, and the headline said that Einstein attacks quantum theory. Scientists and two colleagues find it is not complete even though correct. Huh? Uh, you see, that's... Uh, that's uh, a bad thing of the, of the editors of New York Times, because you had to read the full uh, uh, report to find the name of the two colleagues. Uh. Einstein was put in the headlines, of course. Uh. So uh, Nathan Rosen and, and Boris uh, uh, Podolsky. Now, I'm not going to comment uh, on this uh, paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, the, fo the, the famous EPR paper, but in, I'm just going to tell you about the phenomenon they were addressing, which is a very su subtle phenomenon of quantum mechanics, the phenomenon of entanglement. Uh, if uh, you have, say, uh, two systems entangled, then it can happen that you know perfectly well the global state of the system, but have complete ignorance on the individual state of each system. If, if you find that strange, you are not alone, because Schrodinger in 1935, looking at this phenomenon, wrote that you know, this is the reason, entanglement, that knowledge of the individual systems can decline to the scantiest, even zero, while that of the combined system remains continually maximal. Best possible knowledge of a whole does not include best possible knowledge of its parts, and that is what keeps coming back to haunt us. And I can assure you that that haunts us up to today, okay? the phenomenon of entanglement. Now, how can you produce entangled states? For instance, in labs in Brazil, huh? Rio de Janeiro, huh? the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, in Sao Paulo, huh? Minas Gerais, Belo Horizonte, 
Né? Uh, states like this are produced. The idea is the following. You take a crystal here, and you center the crystal, say, an ultraviolet, ultraviolet light from, from, from some laser, ultraviolet light, and then you see that you don't see, actually, because it's infrared, but there are two beams that come out in the infrared. Now, from the microscopic point of view, a single photon is absorbed from the crystal, and two photons are emitted at the same time. And because they are emitted at the same time, they are called twin photons, okay? born at the same time. Now, this is quite different, of course, from classical optics, where the color of the light does not change, but the direction may change. Here, new colors are produced. Now, under some conditions, these two photons have orthogonal polarizations, but the polarization of each photon is unknown. In fact, in quantum mechanics, we can represent this state like this, by this expression. This tells me that uh, uh, the state of the, of the two photons is a combination, a superposition, actually, of two parts, one in which the first photon is horizontally polarized and the second is vertically polarized, and the other part has the first photon vert vertically polarized and the second photon horizontally polarized. So if someone wants you to bet on the state of the first photon, you know, you cannot say anything. It's 50-50, right? 50-50, which means that you don't know anything about the state. Okay? Now, of course, this can also be written in this way, in a compact way. Uh, if you measure, on the other hand, the polarization of photon 1, this determines the polarization of photon 2. Even if the photon 1 is on Earth and the photon 2 is in Andromeda. Okay? Now, of course, Einstein was not uh, happy about this. In a letter he wrote to Born in 1947, he wrote, I can seriously believe in it because the theory cannot, it means quantum mechanics, huh? because the theory cannot be reconciled with the idea that physics should represent a reality in time and space free from spooky actions at a distance. Uh, and the centers of Einstein uh, went to the media. Uh, you know, I think nowadays you'd say that it would viralize, it viralized, uh, uh, okay, into the media, and very frequent you see this, this sentence in the literature. Now, so let's try to understand this. Uh, you know, how come, you know, this initially you don't know anything about the polarization of each photon. But then Alice measures this photon, and then the, the photon that is with Bob acquires a well-defined polarization, which is orthogonal to the polarization that Alice, that Alice has. Doesn't that violate causality? Let's see. So, you know, suppose we have, therefore, this state here. You have Alice here and our friend Bob here. Uh, and, and, and they have this state here, which means that the polarization of each photon is really not well defined. Huh? Could be horizontally or vertical, they don't know. Huh? In fact, the polarization of each uh, photon is described, for those who know it, by a density matrix, which is a unit density matrix. That means complete ignorance on the state of each photon. Okay? So that's the state they have. But suppose then that Alice measures the polarization of her photon and finds the polarization in the horizontal she knows, because she knows that the state was prepared like this, she knows that the state of Bob is, is a state of horizontal polarization. She knows. Uh, but what about Bob? Well, Bob doesn't know anything. You know, she measured her, uh, the photo that was with her. She has information on the photo. Bob continues to have, he still doesn't have any information on the polarization of its photo. How do we describe that in quantum mechanics? For those who know it, still by a density matrix, unit density matrix, complete ignorance. Uh, so remember the sentence of, of uh, John Wheeler? Uh, basically, uh, quantum physics is quantum information, right? So Alice acquired information on, on the state. So for her, the state is a pure state. Her photon is horizontally polarized. The photon by Bob is vertically polarized. But Bob has not done a measurement. So his state is precisely the same as it was before, a mixture of the two possibilities, complete ignorance about the state of each photon. Unless, of course, Alice sends classical information to Bob and tells him, okay, I measured the horizontal polarization, then he'll know, aha, then 
my polarization is vertical. See? But that's classical information that, that goes to Bob with a speed limit, which is the velocity of light. Okay? So no violation of causality, but also I think there is something conceptual to be learned from this uh, description here. And what has to be learned here is that if you have two observers, uh, in this case sep space separated, uh, the state for one of the observers of the same system is not the same necessarily as the state of the other observer. Different observers see different states for the same system. And that's a peculiarity of quantum mechanics. Okay? Okay? Now, you can also apply here more detailed description, find, describe the measurement that Alice does, and so forth, and you find the same conclusion. By working on the measurement, you find that the state which is Bob, that, has, that is with Bob, remains a mixture state. Now, so these are the, the basics of entanglement, but since then, since the papers by Einstein, Schrödinger, and others, progress has been done experimentally on, on entanglement. You see uh, these titles here, Experimental Demonstration of Five Photon Entanglement and Open Nation Teleportation. Looks like scientific, uh, science fiction. Huh? Uh, remember this name, I'm going to tell you about uh, this name uh, very shortly, uh, Pan, huh? a guy from China. Uh, experimental Entanglement of Six Photons in Graph States. Again, that's a Chinese uh, group with some collaboration with people. Gune, who collaborated with Leandro also, uh, is, is, is this paper here. Uh, it's the same Gune, uh, right? So, uh, Rainer Blatt from Innsbruck has produced uh, with ions a 14 qubit entanglement. So you see, people produce these entangled states with more and more qubits. And the natural question is, you know, what for? <laughs> Why are you spending money with that? And, and there are two answers to this question. First, because entanglement is, is an interesting subject. It is not an easy subject, even from the mathematical point of view. Okay? So uh, if you keep increasing the entanglements, mathematical novelties show up how to classify these states and so forth. And in fact, this, this problem is considered to be a difficult problem from the computational point of view. Uh, so that's one of the answers. Second answer, there is a strong motivation to find entanglement of many particles and to study the resistance of this entanglement to the environment, what we call decoherence. And the, this motivation comes from the fact that entanglement is useful for quantum communication and quantum computation. Now, as, a, as an example of the use of entanglement as a resource for quantum communication, uh, we have this uh, major achievement, I think, of, of the Chinese. Uh, this was uh, done in, this was published uh, in, in June 16, 2017 in Science. Uh, and you see the title, which I mentioned, Spooky Action Achieved at Record Distance. Uh, in fact, the satellite is a quantum communication satellite that was uh, launched in August, 15th of August of last year, by a group led by Pan, the, the same Pan I mentioned to, to you. A young guy uh, got his PhD with uh, Anton Seilinger in Vienna, and... and uh, and uh, then went to Heidelberg, and it was attracted to China with a fantastic uh, salary <laughs> and a fantastic budget. You will not guess his budget. You will not get his budget. Never. You know why? It's unlimited. He can have as much money as he wants. Huh? And I think that's a, that's a nice example to follow in the following sense. See, they picked up a young guy who they knew he, he was very competent, uh, he was a very good guy, very clever, and he gave him all the facilities. His salary is higher than salaries from senior people in that institution. Okay? So something to think about. Uh, something to think about. Uh. They invest in young people, uh, and, and they get this kind of thing. So, uh, so this satellite uh, produces pairs of entangled photons, and the distance between these two points can be up to... Uh, 1,200 kilometers. 
So the idea is to have quantum communication between this site and this site, using entangled photons. Uh, they have uh, shown in this paper here that uh, uh, these photons that come to these two points are entangled. They have tested so Bell inequalities, uh, okay, and uh, and you can ask, how come? I mean, what about the coherence? Huh? Yeah. So yeah. So what about that? Huh? So they have ways to control that, but remember, the coherence occurs only in the Earth atmos atmosphere. So the height of the satellite is 500 kilometers, and the coherence is uh, is at the final 10 what 10 10 10 kilometers, uh, right? The height of the atmosphere. Okay. So that's the advantage of using a satellite instead of fiber optics, because fiber optics you have you know dissipation all the time. No, it's, it's, it, it, they test it, it is a, at, watch out, because they are, they, they are, of course they collide, but they're detecting that in coincidence, okay? So that's a kind of, of post-selection if you want, but it's a natural one, okay? Of course, photons are lost in this way, but then they keep the coincidence, because they know that these photons came from there, and from the same process, okay? Very good, very good question, okay? So, uh, more recently, that was last week, they published uh, uh, a letter in Nature. Actually, it was a funny thing. I didn't know if they had that. Accelerated article preview. They published even before editing, and they warned that uh, the article must still be edited. Uh, but, you know, they, 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 they say that we, it, it, something like, we don't want to be sued for that. <laughs> something like that. You know, but, uh, so, eh? what? Yeah, he became at all the poor, but I think they, he doesn't need his name to appear anymore. You know, <laughs> so you know, well, so uh, uh, this is a demonstration of teleportation yeah, between Earth and the satellite. Yeah. Uh, this distance kilometers, which is the height of the satellite, to 1,400 uh, kilometers when the satellite is more distant. Okay and they have shown that they can make teleportation. Okay? Teleportation means sending a quantum state to a, a another uh, photon which is there in the, uh, in the satellite. Okay? Uh, you may have no cloning. Well, you know, when you send this quantum state, you destroy the original state because you must measure the original photon. Huh? So no cloning is respected. Okay? So that's for quantum communication. And then, uh, Another important possibility for, for quantum information is in, in quantum computation. And that is partially motivated by the limits in classical computation. So you see this is a semi-log curve, uh, which shows the evolution of the number of transistors in the central processing unit of computers since 1971. And uh, they obey the so-called Moore's law. This is Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, and who uh, observed, remarked in, in, uh, in, in, the, in these years here, the number of transistors in the central processes unit doubles every two years, 18 months, okay, in between. Uh, and you see this in, this in this graph here. Now, the first processors here, 1971, had, remember this, I don't know if you remember that, 2,300 transistors only. Uh, the new processors have, you know, here, what, 2 billion, 600 million transistors and more. Okay, that's the, that's the, in 2011, but now they have increased that uh, more and more. So what's the problem with that? Well, the, the size of the central processing units has not doubled with time, fortunately. Otherwise, it would take the planet, right? So it keeps about the same, which means that the information is now kept in smaller and smaller devices. Before, you had this, uh, how do you say, valve, I forgot the name in English. Anyway, valve. Before, you had valves, then transistors, uh, then semiconductors, printed pictures, uh, printed uh, uh, circuits. And now, you know, it's getting smaller and smaller. And if you, if you make the extrapolation of this uh, process, then you see that in about 2010, you'll have 
approximately one atom per bit. That means a single atom will store one bit of information according to what, whether it is in the excited state or in the lower state. Okay? Now, when we get to this limit, it is, of course, uh, unavoidable to think that quantum mechanics should play a role. <laughs> okay? Of course, quantum mechanics already plays a role in our computers because transistors came from quantum mechanics, but I'm talking now about another kind of role. Uh, it means that the software might take advantage of the laws of quantum mechanics. Somebody talked about this as the second quantum revolution. Okay? It's not just the devices, but the very software that should take advantage of the superposition principle and the entanglement huh, in building the computations. Now, there are other motivations for this. One motivation is uh, the factoring problem, which is a difficult problem. So, you know, everybody knows here that 15 is 5 times 3. However, if I give you a, a number like 1 billion, 237 million, 453 uh, thousands, uh, 239, and ask you what are the prime factors, that's tough, right? In fact, the best classical algorithm for factorization of an integer n grows exponentially in terms of the number of steps or the time of computation, goes exponentially in the, num in the length of the number. So the length of the number is just the log of n. The length of the number digitalized, if you want, okay? So this is why there is a famous method of codification of information, cryptographic method, which is called RSA. These are the initials of the author which is used by in banks, internet, and so forth. Actually, you use that when you connect your laptop to the bank. Okay? The information transmitted should be protected, and they use an algorithm that is based on the difficulty of factoring large numbers. Okay? Now, in 1994, Peter Shor, who was working at the AT&T, American Telegraph and Telephone Corporation, demonstrated that a quantum computer could factor uh, a large number, in a number of steps, which is quadratic in the length of the number. Okay? So not exponential, but quadratic. So if someone produces a, a quantum computer, this person could break the codes. Uh, the present codes and the past codes, which might be very interesting, eh? especially security codes of, of some important uh, agencies in other countries. Huh? So, uh, so this the attention to this field of agencies like the Nas NSA, National Security Agency, who started to pour money into this. Uh, in, a, in a fun way, uh, the conferences were open, the guys from NSA would go there, uh, the, uh, the, Army, the United States Army would finance research on that in other countries, but with the condition that the people should go once a year to the United States to tell what they were doing. They, they, they wanted to monitor what was going on in the field, uh, and after some time, they don't talk about this anymore. Well, maybe close the system. Uh, but uh, so money started to come. I identified that here. Okay, because, you know. and then there is another algorithm which was proposed by Grover uh, about around the same time, a little bit later, which is data bank search. You have a telephone directory. Somebody asks you for the n telephone number of some person. That's easier because your ordering is alphabetic. Huh? So you go there and find the person. Suppose someone gives you instead a telephone number and asks you for the name of the person who has that telephone number. Well, you have to search. If you're lucky, it's the first name. If you, are, if you have bad luck, it's the last one. You have to do N searches. In the average, the number of searches is of the order of N over 2. Right? Lucky, bad lucky, bad luck, n over 2. If you use a quantum computer, the number of searches goes a square root of n. So it's not an exponential gain, it's a, it's a quadratic gain. So if you want to uh, make it more concrete, suppose you have a data bank with 1 million data. If you use a classical computer, you have to do half a million searches. If you have a quantum computer, you have to do square root of 1 million, which is 1,000 searches. Big advantage. Okay? 
So this again is interesting for NSA and others because data bank search means, for instance, identifying faces in a crowd. And I hope they don't succeed. Okay? Okay, so that's, uh, that's why they are after this. Okay. Now, there is another possibility also for quantum computation, which I particularly find very interesting, maybe the, more, more interest, the most interesting one, which is simulating physics with computers. That was actually proposed by Feynman in 1981. The argument is very simple, the initial argument. It's like that. Suppose you have a system of n spins. The number of states you can have, you know, each spin can be up or down. So the number of different possibilities is 2 to the n. So the number of states grows exponentially with the number of spins. Poor computer huh, that has to store that number of states. Huh. On the other hand, a quantum computer is nothing more than the physical spins. <laughs> you have atoms there or ions. They can be in one state or the other. You can manipulate the atoms with, with lasers. And if you have n spins, you, must, you need only n atoms, and that's what you have to manipulate. <laughs> so the computation is an experiment, and the, the solution is a measurement. Is, is, it comes through a measurement made on the system. Okay. So uh, now, in December of last year, you see Science uh, published this, uh, this article here. Scientists are close to building a quantum computer that can beat a conventional one. I usually find these claims very optimistic, uh, but here I don't know, maybe. Uh, and this claim comes from a guy called John Martinez. <laughs> John Martinez is a very good guy in superconductivity. Uh, and he had a very good group in the University of California at Santa Barbara. He still has it because he uses the, the address. Uh, in his publications. But he and his group were bought by Google uh, uh, with, uh, with an initial sum of $100 million with the aim of building a quantum computer. Okay? Now, of course, they are doing intermediate experiments. And it was John, uh, John Martinez who mentioned that in one year, he would have a quantum computing ship with 49 uh, qubits. Right now they have seven qubits. Uh, so I, I don't know how they are going to get it, but anyway, he announced that. Uh, this is the ship they have there. Seven, that's with seven, that's a quantum sh ship. Uh, it can calculate simple things, of course. IBM has a also a simple ship, which you can, you can calculate things with it. It's public. Uh, you go to the IBM site, you give them a calculation, simple, and then you get the, the result. And you have to, of course, rely on them that there is not someone doing the calculation with a pen, but it's really the ship that is doing it, okay? And it's <laughs> now, you see John Martinez is here, and you see his address, Google. Uh, Google Santa Barbara, present address, Google, okay? Uh, of course, he also, they also use the address of the University of California at Santa Barbara. Now, uh, I also have another uh, uh, thing that I want to mention here. Uh, you have here this uh, second to last author, Enrique Solano. He was a student of Nisim Zaguri, whom many of you may know, my colleague at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Yes. No, it's not. I'm going to get there. It's not. Not at all. Yeah. So uh, Enrique Solano is now a professor at the University of Bilbao, uh, and he collaborates with John Martinez. He's using he's the theory. He's proposing simulations of Hamiltonians uh, in, in statistical mechanics and also in field theory. But simple Hamiltonians, okay? One-dimensional ones, uh, just to start, huh? simple Hamiltonians. Now, there, there you have. Huh? Of course, the press magnifies it, huh? magnifies it, uh, and says things like, for instance, the age of quantum computing, huh? quantum computing is here. That was in 2014. Huh? It was not clear at that time that quantum computing was there. And I would say that it's not still clear uh, today. Huh? But anyway, they made this, uh, this, ma the, the, this, this uh, news. Uh, and they were talking about the D-Wave computer. And there was a question in the morning about this. You asked about this, uh, which was produced uh, by Canada. Huh? Uh, I don't, 
recommend it to you. First, because it's very big. You cannot use it in your house. It must be refrigerated. Second, because the price is not very convenient. It's $15 million. Uh, so you, you, know, you may think of other things to do with $15 million uh, than using, uh, rather than using a, a, quant a computer that nobody knows if it is quantum or not. Anyway, so uh, Google, of course, was interested in that. Uh, they actually bought together with some other agency uh, a D-Wave just to investigate it. John Martinez worked on that, doing reverse engineering, uh, and, and, and they were worried about the benchmark. And in fact, there, is, there was a controversy on that. Of course, people from D-Wave saying, we have a quantum computer. But then there was this paper uh, in Science that was in 2014 uh, by this group here. You see John Martinez is here. And then you have here Matthias Troyer, who is an excellent guy in computer science. Uh, very, very good. Uh, and and uh, Matthias Troyer uh, actually led the, the, this work. And what uh, they showed is that I mean, they found no evidence of quantum speed up when the entire data set is considered. But they say, in obtaining inconclusive results and comparing subsets of instances, on an instance-by-instance instance basis. It's what, what he says the following, our results do not rule out the possibility of speed, of speed up for other classes of problems and illustrate the subtle nature, nature of the quantum speed up question. So they had uh, you know, a wide uh, data set. Uh, they, made, they used the D-Way for doing that. I remember I, I attended a talk by John Martinez in Santa Barbara. And he was saying that he was comparing, you know, he was trying to solve an optimization problem with D-Wave and also with his laptop. And his laptop gave him the answer faster than the D-Wave using a classical algorithm. And he added that his laptop costed you know, $1,000. Uh, so anyway, but, uh, but you see that uh, he has some new results on that. So, uh, so you see, this led the field open, actually, to other investigations, because after all, he was testing D-Wave uh, with some specific uh, class of software. So now, what is the principle of the wave? What is the wave? So in the wave, you have superconducting circuits, uh, loops. Okay? And they communicate with each other through the for magnetic flux, for instance, couples the two, the two circuits. Uh, uh, actually, you have some tunneling. You may have some tunneling between sites. That's what they claimed from the beginning. And the problem they want to do is called quantum annealing. Now, what's annealing? That comes from metallurgy. Uh, you have some uh, alloy. Uh, you want to produce some alloy. And then you mix the ingredients. And then you lower the temperature very slowly uh, so as to find a, a, a stable ground state. And why is that? Because it's a complex uh, problem. So if you, lose it, if you look at the potential, say, curve associated to this uh, alloy, it has several minima. And you must be sure that you get to the global minimum, because if you stay in a local minimum, the system is not stable. Right? It might diffuse to the, 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 the global minimum. So you must lower the temperature slowly. Here they have the following. They have a Hamiltonian of the easing uh, kind, but it's a generalized easing, because it's not just near neighbor interactions. Uh, have interactions also between several, these several spins. And they have uh, a coupling constant that they start from say, an unperturbed Hamiltonian, which for which the, the result is known. Huh? And they are turning on the, the coupling constant slowly using the adiabatic theorem to get to the ground state of the complete Hamiltonian. And that's the equivalent of, in the sense of annealing, huh? because you get to the ground state of the complete Hamiltonian by turning on the interaction slowly. Uh, it's a complex system. It has local minima too. So you must be sure to attain the global minimum. So that's their idea. Now, uh, why are they interested in finding the ground state of this spin Hamiltonian? That's because the people com for computer science showed that this is equivalent or can be transformed into, s into several other optimization problems, okay? including data bank search, okay? <laughs> so it's, uh, you can transform it into, into that. So that's the origin of the interest in, in this kind of, 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 of computer. However, the initial simulations which are found about quantum annealing with classical computers 
were better than the, those done by, by the quantum computer. However, more recently, that was in 2016, uh, the, uh, the group by John Martinez uh, uh, found a specific problem. Uh, with, uh, as they say here, tall and narrow energy barriers separating local minima. And they showed that for this specific problem, there was a huge advantage of using D-Wave as compared to classical uh, simulation. As they say here, uh, they, they, dealt, they dealt with 945 variables, and, uh, and, uh, and they say that the time to reach a 99% success probability, that is finding uh, the ground, ground state, was 10 to the 8th time faster than the simulation running on a single processor core. Uh. So uh, this seems to be an example of success. Uh, you may ask why the Physical Review X, the editor, Jean-Michel Raymond, told me why. Uh, because he, they consider this as an interesting investigation in the structure of the wave. So it's not just because of the results. It's the fact that this kind of, it's, it's a very specific software after all, but it explores perhaps the only advantage of the wave, which is the tunneling between neighbor sites, okay? But of course, this is still an open problem, uh, and nobody knows if this is working or not. I believe that the computer that John Martinez is doing for Google may use some ideas, engineering ideas of the wave, but it's based on other principles. Uh. Now, so what's the situation now in several countries? So this is the patent applications up to 2015. For quantum computing, the United States is by far the champion. However, you see that in quantum cryptography, China beats the United States. Okay? So the launching of the satellite does not come as, as a surprise if you look at this. Quantum sensors is also an important field. It's related to quantum metrology, which was mentioned by Rafael as one of the things we do uh, nowadays. Uh, and in quantum sensors, United States and China are almost you know, the same right, in terms of number of patents. Uh, if you look at this evolution of the number of patents for quantum key distribution, that's quite interesting because see, the United States had a maximum here, but then China started to grow recently, and now they beat all other countries. Okay? So this decrease uh, in, the, in the number of patents in the United States, I don't know why. Maybe because they found a solution and they don't want to make a patent. Maybe they decided to, to explore other things. I don't know. So just to finish, let me give you some ideas about why quantum computers are powerful. But of course, you know, lot of this is, uh, is need, none of this is really very well understood. Huh? The power of quantum computers is not very well, well understood nowadays. But we can have some hint about it using the superposition principle. So suppose you have a spin, and I'm talking now about spins without, you know, not photons, uh, to use the fact that I know that here people work on condensed matter physics, statistical mechanics, so this may be more familiar. Huh? So suppose you have this product of two spins here, which are eigenstates of this x component of the spin. Huh? Then you make this product here, and you, you can write this state here, this product state in this following way. Now look at these four states here. They represent all the all possible values of two bits from 0, 0 to 1, 1 in a single state. Okay? That's just the binary representation of numbers huh? from 0 to, to 3. Huh? Now, if you have now n atoms, in general, you could have two to the nth inputs, as I mentioned. Uh, the number of states here will be two to the nth. Here we have four. And, and, but still, you can write all the possible inputs in terms of products of states of n atoms put in eigenstates of the sigma x, of, 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 s, of the x component of the spin. Okay? Here, two atoms only are used, and you have four states. If you have n atoms, you have two to the n inputs, but just n atoms here. Now, you can now do computing. How do you do it? 
you take some decomposition uh, of the states, and suppose this is just the initial state, you apply the evolution to it, and you see that by applying the evolution to this state here, but generalized to n atoms, you apply the evolution simultaneously to all possible values of 2 to the nth inputs. Okay? So that's parallel computation by excellence. Okay? You are doing the computation at the same time for all of them. Of course, the outcome of this computation will not necessarily be separable like it is here. In general, you get entangled states. Okay? Now, I think my time has run. I am, I'm not going to talk about these universal gates for quantum computation. Uh, but I want to talk about this. So, you know, quantum computers involve uh, mathematical, mathematical problems and physical problems. So mathematical problems is building of new softwares, huh? which will profit from properties of quantum physics. Physical problems is to build interesting interactions between atoms or electrons that would produce the fundamental gates for quantum computation, huh? that would allow the quantum computation uh, to, to, to be done. And several systems have been imagined for that, superconducting loops, silicon dots, diamond vacancies, topological qubits, and of course the trapped ions that I mentioned before. For the trapped ions, the atoms are stored information, uh, are the qubits. Uh, the harmonic, the, the oscillating uh, uh, degree of freedom is the, is, the, uh, is the bus, which transfers information from one ion to the other. Okay, so this has been, using for, has been used for doing quantum computing. However, all the systems have a common enemy. That's the interaction with the environment. That's the coherence. Now, uh, the coherence is related to the limit, to the classical limit of quantum mechanics. To the, to the answer to the question, why don't we see quantum superpositions in the classical world? Uh, why aren't students delocalized here? Uh, and the coherence tries to answer these questions. Uh, there was an experiment uh, which, uh, which uh, was done at the Ecole Lombard Superior with the group of Serge, using this equipment which I mentioned to you before. You have here a field, an electromagnetic field between these two mirrors. For those who have a coherent state, you send an atom that interacts with this co coherent state, you measure the atom, and by measuring the atom, you can uh, put the state of the field in a superposition, which is equivalent to this one. You have a lighted cavity plus a dark cavity, uh, this is a Schrodinger cat, uh, cat alive, cat dead, but it's a political correct Schrodinger cat, because we are not killing a cat, we are just using light for this experiment, okay? Now, so then we send a second atom to monitor the time-dependent behavior of the this, of this system, and then you can monitor the way by which position of two states becomes a mixture, a classical alternative. Uh, the, the cavity is either lighted or dark, but not in a superposition. Okay? So uh, this experiment could follow uh, this. Now, uh, we have been interested in our group on the resilience of entanglements. And the reason is obvious. Actually, my, the first motivation was, again, the classical limit of quantum mechanics. Huh? What happens when the number of particles increases? But then people from quantum computation started to get interested in that for obvious reasons, uh, because this kills not only the cat, but the quantum computer. Uh, the quantum computer is a cat. Uh, it's a superposition of a large number of, of particles. So it's a cat. Uh, so it kills a cat. Uh, and this is just a sample of some paper produced in our group. Uh, this was a paper which studied experimentally the uh, death of entanglement, the decay of entanglement, which was shown not to follow an exponential law like the decay of an atom. Uh, it's not exponential in time. In fact, uh, if you have two atoms entangled, entanglement can disappear before coherence disappears. Uh, entanglement, in this sense, is more fragile than coherence. Okay? And this was shown in this experiment. Uh, coherence was still there, but entanglement disappeared. Uh, with uh, Le Rafael and Leandro, uh, and also Antonio Assin, Daniel Cavalcanti, we have uh, studied many papers, actually, the dynamics of, uh, of, uh, 
of uh, open entangled systems. Uh, this is just an example of that. And, and uh, more recently, we published this review paper here with Leandro Fernando uh, on open system dynamics of entanglement. So if you want to learn more about it, read this paper, or then ask Leandro. He's, uh, he comes here sometimes. Huh? And to, f to, to finalize, you see, I was, I was better than my advisor, Moises Lucent, because someone told me that after one hour and 15 minutes of colloquium, he said, now we are going to the core <laughs> part of this talk. <laughs> so, and people are already dying there. But OK, so now I'm, I'm really finishing. So it, uh, and, and just to finish, I'd like to show you the, the collaborators in all this uh, adventure in this research. Uh, you know, I guess, uh, many of them, or some of them here. Uh, uh, Leandra Olita, Fernando Melo, Rafael Chaves, Malena. Uh, these four were my PhD students. Uh, I consider, actually, you know, when a PhD student does well in, in the profession, I think that's the best achievement. Right? It's better than many papers, or all the papers. Huh? So I'm very happy about this. Uh, 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 then uh, Osvaldo Jimenez was a co-orientation. Uh, Ale Rosales was a student of, of uh, uh, Huine. Uh, he worked with Steve Walborn as well in the experiments. Gabriel Aguilar uh, with Paulão, Paulo Henrique Souto Ribeiro, who is now in, in Santa Catarina. Marcelo was a PhD student in our group with Paulo Henrique Souto Ribeiro. He's now in Australia uh, for, for, for a long time. Andrea Valdez, a postdoc from, from Mexico. He is Paulo Souto Ribeiro, Steve Walburn, uh, the experimental heroes in our group. Uh, and then external collaborators, Daniel Cavalcanti, Antonia Skin, uh, Joe Eberly from Rochester, and Xiao Feng Qian, who was a postdoc of, of, of Joe Eberly. And uh, also, the other subject which we have dealt with is quantum metrology, quantum sensors. And these are the people who, work, who have worked on that. Uh, Gabriel Bier, Camille Latun, and Bruno Escher were my students. Marcio Tadei was a student of Huinet. Bruno Escher is now a professor there in the Physics Institute. And of course, Nissin, Isaguri, and Huinet are longtime collaborators, uh, good friends, and, uh, and uh, they are responsible for, for many of the things that have been done there. So that's the last uh, slide. This is the, the uh, uh, National Institute for Science and Technology for Quantum Information, uh, which involves all these institutions in Brazil. Lots of people with, uh, 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 right now, uh, an extremely uh, tiny amount of money. I think could, uh, the definition of infinitesimal could be applied to the money each group is getting. Huh? And part of the money is actually virtual. It's, it's interesting. It's an interesting concept. But you know, I guess students here might have this experience uh, in a while when they start getting virtual fellowships. Huh? You know, they will be honored by virtual fellowships. Anyway, so this is, these are the groups. The, this institute, when it, when it had money, uh, offered the possibility of lots of interaction between these groups. Huh? I have people here also who belong to this institute. I see them around. Huh? And, and, uh, and it was very useful, actually, for workshops and interactions and also for buying equipment for experimentalists. We hope money comes back. Thank you very much.